Uh, okay, so this is a brief talk called What is Category Theory? Um, I'm Paul Danstep. I'm a math educator, and I'm really interested in category theory. Uh, and I've, I've often found it very frustrating to try and just explain to people what category theory is or to put it into context in, uh, in a simple way. So this is a brief talk that attempts to do that with a little bit of <laughs> visual accompaniment. Um, so let's begin with this question. What, what is category theory? Um, so one thing is category theory is a mathematical theory. Um, so we can ask maybe a more general question first, which is, what is a mathematical theory? What, what makes something math? Um, so these are three different subjects in mathematics. There's linear algebra, topology, group theory. Um, and these are all about different things, but they all are similarly structured as mathematical theories. So in the end, what we'll see is that category theory, in one sense, is just another mathematical theory. But what I hope will be clear by the end of this is that it also has some distinction uh, among uh, mathematical theories. So let's zoom in on one of these. Let's go to group theory, which is the uh, mathematical theory of symmetry. Um, so these are various objects which have different kinds of symmetry. And um, I, w I won't go too much into the details. Uh, but the basic way of getting to group theory is to look at something like the triangle and see that there are basically six different ways of rotating it or flipping it around, which will preserve its appearance. Uh, and I've color coded them here. And one thing to see, you can imagine like you could rotate it and then flip it, and that effect would be the same as doing one of these, these other ones. So these combine in pairs to form other ones of, of this set. So what we can actually do is go through all possible combinations and come up with a, a table, like a, a multiplication table that sort of captures all that compositional stuff. And this ends up capturing all of the important uh, information about the underlying symmetry uh, of the triangle. And we can do this uh, kind of table making for any shape that has some kind of symmetry. The butterfly has bilateral symmetry, so it has a very simple table, whereas the soccer ball has <laughs> a lot more symmetry, so you get a much bigger table. But basically, this abstracts the thing we're interested in into a common format uh, across all of these different objects. Um, these are essentially uh, groups. And then what we can do is um, generalize uh, the idea of these tables into axioms and start doing deductive reasoning about the symmetries. And this gives us access to a bunch of like new ideas, like uh, normal subgroups, conjugacy classes, these, these things that deepen our understanding of symmetry and which would be really hard to perceive actually if we were still just dealing directly with butterflies and soccer balls and so on. Uh, so for the purposes of this explanation, um, I want to say that this is the structure of a mathematical theory. It, it first of all is uh, about something, so it has a semantics, you know, we're talking about symmetries. And every mathematical theory marries its semantics to, or to some syntax, a, a formal syntax. And we can use the formal rules of the, that syntax to compute uh, and to reason about the semantics and to come to it a deeper understanding. And the idea is that all mathematical theories are basically a syntax married to a, a semantics. So all, all three of these uh, theories, while being about something, have different uh, syntaxes. And each of these was developed uh, to be tailored to the specific needs of each particular subject. And therefore, the, you know, these, these formalisms are really powerful uh, in their local context. But formalisms developed in this way aren't very interoperable. So it, it turns out that there's a lot of benefit to comparing between uh, different mathematical theories. So in algebraic topology, we can actually use group theory to reason about topological spaces. And with <laughs> representation theory, we can use ideas from linear algebra to reason um, about groups. So there, it, there's a lot of fruitful crosstalk uh, between these subjects. And one of the great benefits of moving to a categorical point of view um, is that it gives us a way of dealing with these mathematical structures in a way that makes them much more naturally interoperable. So that, that's one of the great benefits we get from, from categories. So how do we go from here to a categorical point of view? Um, and the way we do that is that we're actually going to represent these theories as directed graphs. Um, and this is part of the talk where I, I, don't, I don't actually know how to motivate this other than to say that directed graphs turn out to be what works. 
Um, so you, you could say it's like given by nature in a way, in the same way that like biology uh, finds that the double helix is the right structure to encode genetic information. Um, in mathematics, we find that directed graphs with nodes and arrows are the correct or the, the nice, and very nice universal template for encoding mathematical theories. So let's give this a try. Can we, for example, take topology and represent that theory um, as a directed graph? So in topology, these are the kinds of things you study. These are topological spaces. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take each individual topological space and these are going to form the nodes uh, of our graphs. So each of these shapes is going to get its own dot and now to fill it in we're going to make arrows uh, between these dots. So what does it mean for an arrow to go from one topological space to another? Well, um, so on the left we have a circle and on the right we have a donut. And what an arrow will represent is a way of mapping or embedding that circle into that donut. So this arrow, for example, might represent sort of a ring around the side of the donut. A different arrow will represent a different map. So this one might be you know, setting the circle on top like a halo. Um, and of course, there are lots of different ways of mapping a circle into a donut. Um, in fact, there's an infinite number of ways. And I can't really depict an infinite number of arrows, but we can imagine just a whole lot of arrows uh, going from one of these to the other. And, and the idea is to understand that there is actually a whole dense bundle uh, of arrows going from those two topological spaces. We can also uh, go from the circle to other things. So there's a whole bunch of ways of mapping a circle into a trefoil knot, but there's also a whole bunch of ways of mapping back the other way. So this is kind of a bi-directional affair. Um, there's also a set of connections from uh, the donut to the trefoil knot. You can also map a topological space to itself. Like if I take a rubber band and uh, twist it and fold it over, I've, I've doubled it up. So you can have arrows pointing from a topological space back to itself. So there's all these self-pointing arrows um, at all of the knots. Uh, and this starts to get really dense looking, so I'm going to thin it out a little bit, but just you know, imagine that it's all filled in with a lot of arrows. And what we're do, we'll do is just go through the entirety of topological spaces and all possible relationships between them and just fill in the grand <laughs> comprehensive totality of um, everything there is to talk about in topology. And we get this enormous uh, directed graph. And this is a category. Um, so when you think of a category, you should just think of an incomprehensibly vast network of uh, uh, dots and arrows. Um, this is a particular category called top, uh, which encompasses topological spaces. And every arrow is um, just a map from one space to the other. Um, and we can do this same treatment to all of our different um, mathematical subjects. So for instance, we can look at two vector spaces, which are the subject matter of linear algebra. In this case, an arrow is just a linear transformation from one space to the other. Uh, and if we make the compendium of all such linear transformations, we get another category. This one's called vect. And finally, we can do this for symmetry groups as well. So if I take any two symmetries, uh, there's some number of ways of embedding one symmetry in another. These are called group homomorphisms. And if we make a directed graph of all group homomorphisms, we get the category uh, group. So now we have our three subjects, but they're all now <laughs> encoded in a, a common template. And much like we did with group theory, um, we can axiomatize uh, this structure and start to investigate it systematically. Um, and this gives rise to a whole new set of ideas that are really specific to uh, category theory. And they're all sort of characterized in terms of little generic diagram figures that appear in, in all of these different contexts um, and give us just a whole new world of deductive capabilities for investigating mathematical structure. So with all that picture in mind, um, we can now sort of complete an analogy uh, that helps us understand what is category theory. So in the case of group theory, we start with a semantics, the symmetries of things, uh, and then we encode it into a common template, and then we carry out uh, a bunch of reasoning and discovery using the affordances uh, of, that, of that representation. So category theory does just the same thing, but kind of one level up. So it takes as this semantics uh, individual mathematical theories, encodes them once again into a common format, and then uh, uses the 
format to develop new deductive tools uh, and ideas to help us investigate mathematical theories uh, in new ways. So um, I've always really loved uh, Eugenia Chang's characterization of category theory that uh, category theory is the mathematics of mathematics. Whatever mathematics does for the world, category theory does for mathematics. And this is kind of just my <laughs> attempt to illustrate that idea. Uh, and hopefully, without going into any of the details about what category theory actually consists of, um, and my hope is that this helps put it into some uh, useful context for people. So uh, that's the talk. Thanks so much.